Well, you are welcome indeed. I'm Pastor Swafford. Welcome to our Bible study. God bless you. Thank you so much for taking the time out this evening to be a part of the study. I pray that all is well with you and your family and that the Spirit of the Lord is moving in your life. All of your needs are being met and that the Lord is truly, truly being glorified. Amen. Got a few announcements I'm going to share with you, and then we're going to get into the Word of God. Uh, First, we've got Seniors Zoom Merry Christmas, and that's going to be December the 19th, and you'll see the information on your screen as to how to uh, connect with that. And then uh, it's here. Next week, we've got our Christmas Advent Play, uh, uh, December the 23rd, and that's going to be exciting, uh, uh, 7 o'clock p.m., so uh, uh, looking forward to that. And then also our New Year's Eve service. That's going to be December the 31st. So uh, stay tuned for a confirmed time on that. We're still working on that. So that's that's all of the announcements that I have for you. But I got a special treat for you this evening. The Word of God is going to be coming to you today from our very own uh, Reverend Glenn Hand. Greetings and welcome to Rivers of Life Church Ministries Online. I'm Reverend Glenn Hand, and it's my distinct honor and privilege to be with you and sharing the Word of God with you on today. And I take it not for granted uh, that this responsibility has been placed upon me. I want to thank Pastor Swafford for his trust in me to put me in this place and trust me giving the Word of God to uh, our congregation on uh, on today. So. As James tells us and cautions us, those who teach, uh, and I'll paraphrase, he says, don't be too anxious to become a teacher because you're going to be held to a higher standard. So those of us that sit or stand in this position, uh, well, we better be aware of that because it's an awesome responsibility, but it's also a blessing as well. And I thank you uh, for listening. I I thank you for your trust in me, Pastor, as well. So I also want to share with you all that I hope and I pray that everyone is doing well in this most trying of times. Uh, I I pray that your family is well, that you are well uh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Know that God is with us. God is with us at the beginning, in the middle, and there's an end to this and God is already at the end he's been with us throughout everything and he'll continue to be that and as pastor says it's going to be all right yes it is it's going to be all right so mark your bibles to uh the gospel of mark chapter 1 verse 35 uh that's our foundational scripture for this teaching uh let us pray and get started in the word father god we just thank you And I thank you. I thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I ask you to empty me on this uh, evening and have the word of God come forth through me, but from you. I've studied, I've prayed, I've written, but Father, your Holy Spirit is truly the teacher. So Holy Spirit, please teach. Please teach today to your people. I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for your blessings, both seen and unseen. And I ask you to continue to bless our ministry and our pastor and everyone. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and we give thanks. Amen and amen again. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. One small, quick verse. And that's all it takes. You could go verse by verse through the Bible and have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of teachings. And we are blessed to have a Bible that does that for us. But in Mark chapter 1, and Mark is uh, is like a movie that goes quickly through the action. When you look at all the Gospels, they all have their distinct flavor and their distinct point of view and their distinct way of presenting Jesus to us. And, it, and, and it's beautiful in, in its multifaceted 
uh, presentation of Jesus' ministry uh, for us. So Mark, right away in chapter 1, uh, we have a lot of action. And we get to uh, verse 35 in chapter 1, and it says this. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he, Jesus, went out and departed into a solitary place. A solitary place, that is a deserted place. <clears throat> and there he prayed. In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. So, I want to talk about prayer tonight. I want to talk about prayer and all its, and prayer is important always. Uh, uh, I think we're discovering, uh, some of us rediscovering the importance of prayer uh, in the year 2020. But I want to talk about prayer and it, in all its forms. And I want to introduce you to maybe a form that may be new to you, uh, that you haven't practiced before. And I want to talk about prayer as a practice something that we practice, that we habitually do, uh, that we don't use as an emergency exit, okay? But it's something uh, that we constantly do to be close to God, to converse with God, to experience God, right? To experience the divine. So my objective is to encourage and to help every one of us to actively develop and strengthen every aspect of our prayer life, every aspect to it. There is a range of features of prayer and types of prayer and expressions of prayer and purposes of prayer and aims for prayer and goals for prayer. And we're going to talk about and look at biblical examples of, of many of them that you are no doubt familiar with. But I'm going to start out with what are we? What are we as humans, really? What are we? A bunch of cells and organs and tissues, right? We're physical. We have a mind. We think. But we also have a spirit, right? This triune makeup of, of humans, there's a body, there's a physicality. There is a mind that operates with an ego and an id and, and all kinds of uh, different uh, modes and, uh, of thinking and thought, uh, uh, control of our emotionality, uh, our, and, and, and in the, it's in the center of our body, and on the other side is our spirit. And our spirit often is neglected, even when we pray, even if we pray, depending on how we pray and why we pray and how often we pray and the character of our, our prayers. But we have a natural body. Paul talks about it in Corinthians. But he also talks about a spiritual body, and he's talking about during, at the resurrection. But there, he, he's making a distinction between the physicalness of human, humans and, and the spirituality of humans. So, and the mind is in the center, right, of this triune makeup of humanity. We have a, a body, we have a spirit, and we have a mind. And the mind is kind of the battleground. That's where we make decisions. That's where we uh, process the information that our body gives us. We experience the world through our eyes and our ears and our, 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 our mouth, our taste, our smell, our, and, and we, our mind makes decisions about that, about what we see and how we perceive, right? But if we neglect our spirit, there's a price to pay for that. And again, we can, you can even be a praying person and perhaps your spirit is being neglected. <clears throat> Maybe uh, you can be saved but spiritually disconnected. I want to talk about prayer as a habit, as a habit to habitually pray and intentionally pray. And psychologists say it takes about two months for a new behavior to become habitual or a habit or automatic, right? So I, I want us to, to look at prayer, and if you don't have prayer as a habit, I want you to, to aim at developing prayer as a habit. Hopefully this teaching will help you with that. 
Because I want us to have a habitual prayer life, a practice that benefits us beyond mere wish fulfillment. And I don't mean that to sound as mean as it sounds or as uh, negative as it may sound, but if you think about it, if you think about it objectively, I would say the majority of our prayer life is wish fulfillment. And I don't mean trivial things, right? I mean important things. Praying for someone who's dying or sick is not a trivial thing. Interce interceding for someone is not trivial, but it is a type of wish fulfillment, right? A practice that has the deep spiritual benefits, a practice that includes a spiritual connection with the divine as its purpose, a spiritual connection with the divine, a divine experience, and I'm not talking about speaking in tongues or running around the church, okay? Speaking in tongues has its place. It has its place. It's in the Bible. But there's restrictions on it, and there's, uh, there are things that uh, make it specific. I'm talking about a prayer life that includes a connection with the divine. But the reality is, and we say this in our prayer life sometimes, we say it in prayers, uh, I've heard preachers say it, and I've said it in prayer, seeking God's face and not his hand, right? Seeking God, we seek God's face and not his hand, we say so fervently. But the reality is most of our prayer life by necessity is hand seeking because of the way life is in this fallen world for humans. Thank God we have a God. Thank God we have a God who cares. Thank God we have a God that we can pray to and he hears and answers. Even when sometimes, and most often I believe, the answer is no or wait. Hmm. But there has to be a balance between our body and our mind and our spirit. Right? If we overemphasize one aspect, the others lose. So I'm not saying to overemphasize our spirit. I'm saying not, don't neglect it. I'm not saying neglect our mind or, or, or uh, uh, disassemble our mind. I'm saying use it rationally, use it wisely. I'm not saying forget about your body and become an ascetic and starve and fast all the time. And No. What I'm saying is there has to be a balance in our life, in our Christian life, in our prayer life, because our prayer life is how we communicate with God. Our spiritual self must be fed and nurtured equally. Now, I'm laying out the importance of spirituality to lay the foundation of the type of praying that I want to teach later in this teaching. After we explore different types of prayer, First, we're going to look at how Jesus teaches prayer in Matthew 6. And then we're going to look at a few examples of prayer in the Bible, types of prayer that the model prayer teaches us. So in Matthew 6, starting in, in verse 5, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus says this. He's teaching the disciples, and he's in public. And he says this, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Okay? Uh, some people pray like that. Uh, Jesus is kind of calling that out. But for this teaching, I'm, we're not even really talking about that. We're talking about people that sincerely pray. But when you pray... Go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So, again, there's this solitude, this secretness, this aloneness that prayer calls for, that fervent prayer calls for. Jesus gets up early in the morning, hours before dawn, goes into a solitary and a desolate place, and prays to God. Jesus teaches to go into that secret place and talk to the Father. <clears throat> then he teaches the model prayer. And verse 9 says, So in this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know the prayer. We've heard it thousands and tens of thousands of times. And within that prayer, 
seem, is uh, some of the different iterations of prayer, different ways to pray, different types of prayer, a different intentionality in prayer. There's adoration, right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So prayer should have an element of adoration and agreement. Uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we have this idea of agreement with God, right? Uh, also, supplication. Give us this day our daily bread. Supply. So prayers of supplication are, are valid and important prayers, I'm, and I don't want to minimize that, and I certainly don't. Supplication not only for ourselves but for others. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So there's justice there, right? And contrition, prayers of contrition, to be sorry for what you've done. And then, of course, acknowledging God's sovereignty, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. So these are certain features of prayer. It is not a exhaustive list of prayers. This is a model prayer that Jesus has taught us, and it's a good way to model your prayer after this prayer. But I don't think Jesus said to pray this prayer, although we do and people do, and that's fine. There's no prohibition of that. But Jesus said it's a model prayer. This is some of the features of prayer, right? So. Let's look at a few examples, and I'll talk about some and, 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 and kind of uh, put a few under the microscope. <clears throat> in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, we have an example of a prayer of supplication, asking for something. And in, in 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2, we have the story of Hannah. And Hannah is barren and is desperate for a child. She has a, uh, a husband who has another wife uh, who has several children, and her heart breaks to have a child. And she goes and she's praying, and she's in the temple, and Eli, uh, who was the high priest at the time, sees her, and she's praying earnestly to God, praying for a child to take away her parents. She promises God that if she's given this child, that she'll give it back. And when Eli sees her, her lips are moving and she's just earnestly in prayer. He thinks she's drunk. That's how intensely she's praying. Well, he finds out that she's not drunk and of course he blesses her and of course God gives her Samuel. And she keeps her promise. She keeps her promise and she gives Samuel back. Keeping your promises, keeping your vows are important. <clears throat> and after, as she brings Samuel back, she prays another prayer, and it's a prayer of thanksgiving, and it's a wonderful prayer. And she talks about how sovereign God is and how uh, loving and wonderful God is and, and how God is above all things, and it's just wonderful to be blessed by God and to know God. So that's a prayer of thanksgiving. In the New Testament, we see Mary, the Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus, says the same kind of prayer at what has come to be known as the uh, after the Annunciation, where Gabriel tells her she's going to uh, have God's child, Jesus, right? She's going to bear the Lord's, uh, God's child. And she goes in Luke, she visits her uh, cousin Elizabeth, who is John the Baptist's mother, and they have this experience where the baby leaps in, in Elizabeth's womb, and, and Mary, uh, she greets Mary and says, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Uh, Jesus, and, and, and Mary blurts out this prayer of adoration to God and this prayer of praise to God. It's called the, the Magnificat, even. It's because I magnify the Lord is the first lines. And this is wonderful prayer that's, that is similar and kind of parallels Hannah's prayer, which kind of tells me that Mary, being Jewish, uh, had a, a knowledge of how to pray and probably knew the story of Hannah and probably had read or at least heard uh, in synagogue Hannah's prayer recited. So 
we have uh, two, two examples. We have a prayer of anguish from Hannah. We have a prayer of thanksgiving from Hannah. We have a prayer of adoration and praise from Mary, the mother of God, mother of Jesus. And we have a, a wonderful prayer of contrition from David in Psalm 51. And I just want to read a bit of it. And this is a prayer of contrition for the... His sin, he commits murder because he wants Bathsheba, who is the wife of someone else. And he composes this prayer, and he says this in Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my inequity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. He is honest in his prayer. We have to be honest in prayer, especially prayers of contrition. Verse 7 says this, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. And of course, the beautiful part of this uh, psalm, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So this is a powerful prayer of contrition. And it's certainly... Uh, uh, a model of the honesty and the truthfulness of being contrite. That that is imperative. If you're going to pray to God in contrition for something you have done, you have to acknowledge that you did something wrong. Right? He says, David says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and I've done this evil in your sight. He doesn't run and hide or make excuses, and, and it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful uh, example of this type of prayer. Prayer is beautiful there has, in all its different facets. We have prayers of intercession. We have examples of Abraham. Abraham intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah with God. He bargains with God. When you read it in Genesis 18, I'm not going to read it now. Uh, you probably know the story. If not, go to Genesis 18 and read it, or uh, read it again. It's great. He bargains with God because Lot, because his nephew Lot is is a resident, and he doesn't want Lot to die. So he says to God, you know, if you find 50 righteous, would you destroy the whole thing? God says no, and he says, well, 40. How about 30? And he 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 gets. He's bargaining with God. Well, God still destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, but he still listened to Abraham. He interceded. Moses has more success in his intercession in Exodus 32 when he comes down from Mount Sinai with the law, which is a beautiful thing for the community of Israel, the law of God for them. He has this, he's just had this this deep divine experience, and he comes down, and what have they done? Well, they melted all their gold, and they made a golden calf, and they've regressed back to uh, pagan practice and, and, and worshiping other gods outside of, uh, outside of God. And God is so angry, he tells Moses, I'm going to kill them all, and I'm going to make you a great nation. And Moses says, no. You don't want to do that. Don't do that. Because how would the world look at you? These are your chosen people. God listens. He changes God's heart. He intercedes successfully. And then there's Jesus, whose life is a prayer. It's the greatest example of a prayer of intercession. His entire life was a prayer of intercession. He interceded for us, for our transgressions, for what we should be responsible for. And he gave his life. And we want to talk about, we're going to talk more about uh, Jesus' decision and try to examine as much as we can with our limited understanding what it meant 
for Jesus to become human, for God to become human. And then another type of prayer is, a, and I, I didn't quite know what to call this one, but uh, I know, Pastor, you won't be surprised that I'm turning to Job. Uh, you know that I have a fondness for this book. <clears throat> and I could call, you can, we can call this a prayer of contention, a prayer of questioning, a, a prayer of, of trying to understand why things happen for his dark night of the soul. And if you read Job, it is, it is sprinkled with these prayers and these, this contention uh, throughout, liberally. And, and one example is here in, ver in chapter 9, starting in verse 11. And he, he's talking about God. He's talking to someone. It's not, a, it's not a, a de facto a, a prayer, but it is. But it is. <laughs> It is a questioning of God, to be sure. He says, if he goes by me, I do not see him. If he moves past, I do not perceive him. If he takes away, who can hinder him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? God will not withdraw his anger. The allies of the proud lie prostrate beneath him. How then can I answer him? How can I do this and choose my words to reason with him? For though I were righteous, for though I were righteous, he's saying it, I, I know I didn't do anything wrong. I could not answer him. I would just beg mercy of my judge. If I, if I called and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. <laughs> for he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. Okay? He's contending with God. <laughs> I will not, he will not allow me to catch my breath. But he fills me with bitterness. If it is a matter of strength, indeed he is strong. And if of justice, who will appoint my day in court? Who will appoint my day in court? Though I were righteous, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I were blameless, it would prove me perverse. I am blameless, yet I do not know myself. Huh. I despise my life. It is all one thing. He comes to conclusion in this portion. Therefore, I say, he destroys the blameless and the wicked. That's a powerful challenge and description of God. I have had my Job moments with God over the past few years. Uh, and, and, and contention with God. God, see, God, God doesn't mind that. God doesn't mind that Job does this. What it, what, what he, now, he doesn't get the answers that he wants. He just finds out how sovereign God is, and he understands that, as he says in, in, in what I just read, what we just uh, listened to, that, well, the righteous and the wicked both suffer equally, right? And that's God's call. And he, and, he understand, and he comes to understand that. But God doesn't punish him for questioning. And, and, and I had some experience with this over the past few years. Uh, I have a daughter that, was, that, was, that I wasn't particularly close to. We had kind of drifted apart, and we talked occasionally and texted sometimes and emailed some other times and occasionally spoke. <clears throat> But uh, I found out uh, that she called me and told me that two years ago, three years ago, now she was uh, uh, diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and had to go through chemotherapy. And she called me two days before she was going to get part of her lung removed. And uh, I was, I was Job-like. I was like, you know, and part of it was guilt, I'm sure. Uh, my guilt of being absent in a lot of ways to my daughter. <clears throat> it brought us together uh, because uh, she winds up, winds up going to Georgia to get immunotherapy. I reunite with her after having not seen her for many, many years. And that's two years ago, and she is now cancer-free. So... 
that could be a prayer of preparation because earlier in this year, in February, we found out that my, that my wife, Margaret, had the same lung cancer and had to have the same surgery. And, but God gave her a headache one Sunday, and because of that headache, we found out that she had lung cancer, something that we wouldn't have found out otherwise. Thank you, God. Mm. But that contention with God two years before was, was, was my prayer, was a prayer of preparation for me because I knew that, that Margaret was going to be fine. I knew it. There was no doubt in my mind. There was no doubt in her mind. And they found it so early, chemotherapy wasn't necessary, and Margaret is fine. She's fine. God's good. So prayer takes on all these forms. And I just wanted to share that with you because prayer is powerful. Contending with God is okay, but know your position. <laughs> know your position. <clears throat> but he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligent seeking. Looking for God. Looking for God. Mm -hmm. So prayer takes on all these forms. So when should I pray in all these fashions? Well, when the circumstances of your life dictate it, right? When, but why did I bring us all this way? Well, my objective was to encourage us to, and to help equip us to actively develop and strengthen every aspect of our prayer life. So we went through a lot of access, uh, types of prayer. We've seen examples. But all these prayers that we looked at, were reactions. They were reactive prayers. They were reacting to something that happened, right? Hannah's reacting to her barrenness. Hannah's reacting, Hannah is reacting to God's granting her of a son, right? Abraham's reacting to the threat to Sodom and Gomorrah and his nephew. Moses is reacting to God's threat to destroy Israel. Mary's reacting to the birth, to the impending birth of Jesus. Job is reacting to all that happens to him. These are all prayers of reaction. <clears throat> they mix physical, mental, and spiritual experiences together. So what kind of prayer am I talking about that's kind of left out here? And I, I don't want to say it's left out because Jesus is the example. Okay? Remember our foundational scripture. He gets up early, long before dawn, seeks out a solitary place, and then he seeks out God. Hmm? So what kind of prayer am I talking about? And I had a dilemma uh, naming, putting a name to this, because meditation uh, came to mind. And we talk about m meditating in prayer. Uh, and, uh, and Pastor and I talked about this even, because uh, I was concerned that you would, you know, I don't want anyone to think that I'm advocating some sort of meditation practice from uh, other practices such as Buddhism or Hinduism or Zen or, or something of that nature. I'm talking about a Christian focus on God, on the God that we understand. So I thought about meditative prayer, but the, and the Old Testament uses that, uh, and, and, but it, the root word in Hebrew is translated like 10 or 12 different ways. It can be to moan, it can be to mourn, to speak, to declare, to utter, to mutter. It has a lot to do with speech, right? It also can mean to imagine. In the New Testament, meditation in the New King James Version is only mentioned three times, and the Greek word means to think upon or to ponder. So I didn't think it, I didn't think meditation, no, meditative prayer was, was what I was, what I want to focus on. So I came upon the Greek word kononia, kononia, okay? And, and that means communion. It means participation and fellowship and sharing and partnership. So I'm talking about a prayer of communion. Its aim is a spiritual connection with God's divine personage, God's divine presence. Locating God, the God in us, Emmanuel, God with us, locating the God in us. It's an effort to empty ourselves 
in our body, our mind, and locating God in our spirit. It's an attempt to make a spiritual space for God's spirit to become apparent, not a space to empty ourselves so God can come in. What I'm saying is God is already there, right? God's already there. It's making a space so we can locate God in us, God's spirit. I'm going to read 1 Kings 19. Very familiar passage of scripture. Starting in verse 11. This is Elijah and God. Then he said, this is God speaking. Go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And that's what Elijah heard, that still small voice. And that still small voice exists in all who believe. What I'm talking about in this prayer of communion is a prayer where you ask God for nothing, nothing physical, no supplication. You're asking for God to, you're asking God to help you empty yourself of all these active things that run and racing around in your brain and your mind and blocks your way of seeing the God in us. And once you start to be able to see the God in yourself, you will see the God in others. And that's the purpose. This is a practice that I have started doing for a while now in my morning prayers to God. And this should be done in the morning. Jesus did it in the morning. He got up long before dawn and went to a, an isolated place. Whenever you get up, I guess we'll do. I do like to kind of merge it with the dawn coming, the coming of the sun. But is this even a thing? Is it even a thing? I mean, am I just making this up? Uh, well, I, I want to read a prayer that, that Jesus gives uh, praise to God in uh, John 17. I love John. The Gospel of John is very esoteric and divine uh, snapshot of Jesus, very much unlike the other three Gospels. And that's why I said at the beginning, the Gospels are, are, are just wonderful in, when you view them in their singularity and see how, God is, how Jesus is presented by each of the writers. It's, it's a beautiful thing. But Jesus prays this prayer in John, <clears throat> uh, chapter 17, starting in verse 20. He's praying to God out loud, right? And he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. All right? That's us. We're gonna, we, we believe in God through their word, right? <clears throat> that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. One in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 23 says, I and them and you and me, I and them and you, God, in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Embedded or not so embedded in that scripture is the interconnectedness of us and God. Jesus is saying it's a real it's a real thing. It exists. So there's this idea also, as I come to a close. <clears throat> in Greek, it's an idea called kenosis. It means an emptying. Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 2. Chapter 2, starting at verse 5, he says, he's talking to the Philippian church, and he says, let, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And a better way to look at that is, is Jesus didn't see his divinity as something to be exploited. He took on this greater purpose of becoming human, a little less than God, a little lower than angels, right? 
<clears throat> but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So this idea of kenosis, this idea of Jesus, of God, Jesus emptying himself to become human. And I talk about this prayer, this prayer of communion to empty ourselves so we, make, so we can locate that God in us that Jesus is praying about. This emptying of us. So again, when should we do this? I suggest we do it in the morning. I do it in the morning. You who already have the habit, remember habits take a, new habits take about 60 days, two months, to, to form uh, as a part of your life, as a habitual uh, part of your life. So I would say do it in the morning. Make it part of your prayer time. I have found that it... <clears throat> Not only is it calming, but it, it makes the rest of my, my time with God in the morning much more fruitful and productive. So how do you do this? Well, find yourself a quiet setting, right? You can be still. Be still. Sit or kneel, whatever is comfortable. Eyes open, your eyes closed. Just breathe and relax. Be still. We have trouble being still. And that's part of our problem with our mind. Our mind wants to race, race, race. And that was the beginning when I started to, tr uh, to, to attempt to, to do this prayer of communion, not asking for anything but the location of you in me. The hardest thing to do was to calm my mind. So what I started to do was I chose the scripture uh, and, and would think about it or repeat it in my head. 2 Corinthians 13, 17 is one I use quite often. The Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is peace. There is peace. I took uh, Numbers 6, and I kind of reworded it and said, May, uh, Lord, show me your face and grant me your peace. Lord, show me your face and grant me your peace. And just sitting quietly and I sit with my eyes open. And as the sun comes up and it gets lighter around me, I'm outside. And I'm just looking for God in me. I'm not asking you for anything. I just want to locate you. It sounds crazy, maybe, to some. Maybe it's not for everyone. Maybe you don't see the value in this. But I invite you, those that already pray in a morning habit of prayer and, and meditation and scripture reading to start your day, I invite you to start to incorporate this. Try this prayer of communion with God, this prayer of asking for nothing but emptying some of myself so I can move the clutter and see you in me. Where are you, God, in me? And when you locate that, if you can get a glimpse of that, and you can start to see the God in everyone else, it's a powerful type of prayer. It is not better than or greater than any of the other prayers that we talked about. They are all of value, and they all have their place, and they are all important. But this particular prayer is a prayer that asks for nothing. A prayer that asks for nothing, but empty me so I can see you in me. Jesus talked about being one with the Father and being one with us. Jesus gets up early in the morning and goes to be alone there time and time again in the Gospels when you read the Gospels. He goes to be by himself. It's an important aspect of his ministry. As I said, this might not be for everyone, and you might think it's crazy, but I do invite you to try. And if you don't have this type of prayer life, a habit, where it's a habit, and it's an emergency exit only when something goes wrong in your life, start the habit of starting your day with God. 
All right? Even if you don't attempt this, make your prayer life something valuable. Thank God and ask for nothing. When it's, in, when it's important, we need to ask. Prayer of supplication is a legitimate form of prayer. There's nothing wrong with it. But I think of equal value, at least I've found in my experience now, that this prayer of communion, this prayer of emptying, this prayer of asking to find God in me, has been very fruitful. And that's why I do it. I invite you to add this to your toolbox of prayer. Something else, something else to deal with this lost and dying world that we inhabit. Amen? Amen. Father God, we just thank you. I thank you. I thank you for the possibility of getting to get to know you, just a glimpse of you, Father. I pray, I pray that others follow suit. I pray that others pray earnestly and seek you daily because you say in your word you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. So I pray for diligent seekers of you and finding you in them and in their spirit, and to not be neglectful of their spiritual life. It is more important than our physical life because our spirit will outlast our bodies, Father, and we know that. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, and we give thanks. And if you're under the sound of my voice and you haven't asked Jesus into your life, all you have to do is ask. Just ask Jesus to come into your life. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. That's what the word says. So pray that prayer. Say, God, Jesus, enter my heart, my mind, my spirit. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for our sins, and you were raised from the dead. You sit at the right hand of the Father and intercede for us now. Ask for the Holy Spirit to enter you, and you will be saved, and you will be changed. And if you prayed that prayer, please reach out to us. Reach out to us and email us at, here at Rivers of Life Church Ministries, and we have some information that will help you on your journey. So I thank you all. I thank you for your listening tonight. I pray for your families that everything remains well. Stay encouraged, be blessed, seek God in your heart. Amen. Thank you for joining today's broadcast. Please visit us on our website at rolcm.org.